Hey everybody, it's Liz from Delaney and Sons. And as you can see, we have more than just one person here today. I am interviewing a few people. And before I get into introductions, I have a question. When you think of American gun makers, what names pop to your mind? Um, of course, maybe Parker, maybe Fox, Lefevre, maybe Elsie Smith. Well, we have all four represented here today, and all four are going to be at the Vintage Gunners Cup this September. So hi, guys. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Liz. Hi, Liz. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. yeah, well, um, not to give anything away, but at the end of this conversation, we are going to talk about a challenge we're having, and it's not the Parker versus Fox, because that's been done a lot, and it's not the Lefever versus L.C. Smith. That's maybe been done before. We at the Vintage Gunners Cup, we're going to do an American versus European side-by-side -side challenge. Isn't that going to be fun? I'm so excited. Well, we don't have anybody representing the Europeans right here, but we have the American classics here. And to start us off, let's have Mike from Parker talk about, Mike, how did you get in? Introduce yourself. Tell us how you got into shooting and tell us more about Parker's. I'm, I'm just learning about these guns and whatever you have to say, I'm, I'm all ears. Okay. Uh, my name is Mike Koneski. Uh, my wife and I own Rock Mountain Sporting Clays. We're the co-editors of the Parker Pages, uh, the journal of the Parker Gun Collectors Association. And I got into shooting, boy, I was a little kid and most of us started with, you know, BB guns and 22s. And I started with my pappy's Winchester model. I think it was model 67, single shot, bold action 22. And used to follow him around when he was walking around the farm and, then used his uh, 16 gauge Stevens side by side. And that was the first side by side I ever shot. And the hook was set way back then. Uh, my, my, my first own, my first shotgun that I owned 1974, I got an Ithaca model 37 Featherlight for Christmas and I still have the gun. So out here in the safe, if anybody wants to see it, <laughs> it works like, works like a clock. Uh, from there, we got into, did a lot of action handgun steel challenge epsic bowling pins and sportsman team challenge came around for three-man teams and we traveled around the east coast and down to florida doing that and one of the events well half of the events in team challenge were shotgun events mixed bag flush and flurry so when we didn't have anything set up to practice those three individual events we started going and shooting sporting clays and my gosh, I swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. I I was done. It was all over, all downhill from there. And that that's when the bug bit me. Um, as for why I got involved with Parker's, uh, I mean, I was I was involved with a, a few other guns in the past too. And as most of us, we've we've owned um, guns from all of the different makers. And then you just have to narrow your focus down. And because of uh, the Parker membership, there's about 1,500 members uh, in the Parker Gun Collectors Association with a, such a deep knowledge base. And it's they're not just collectors, but shooters and hunters. And you know, being involved with uh, the association, with the magazine, the contacts that we make, it's just. Um, incredible the things that have gone on out in the past and, and the history of the gun maker, you know, Charles Parker started as a button manufacturer and then he started making other things, coffee grinders and silverware and all sorts of things in the hardware, hardware and housewares realms. Uh, and his first go at gun making was Parker and snow and company musket contract uh that was around 1961 so they had musket contract for the union army and of course when the war was over he he decided i really like making guns i can make some money making guns and 
1867, he started manufacturing Parker shotguns. And Parker was manufactured by the Parker Brothers Company until 1934 when Remington purchased them. And then Remington, around 1937, uh, with the war ramping up, they kind of stopped production of the Parker side by side. So you had 70 years there, along with uh, you know the, the Parker repros that are made, and you know, it just just the history and and the people involved. Uh, it really fuels my competitive fire. <laughs> well, that's so, a lot of members. 1500s, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. And I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm able to um, work with Chuck Bishop, who is who is our basically our gun letter historian, and he's teaching me how to do research letters. So, along with contact with all these other people, I get to see all the all of the order books and stock books and all the information from all those guns that Parker made that we have records of, and it's just mind blowing the things that were done, how fast these guns were produced, how well they were made, and how many were made. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they made over 240,000 guns in, that's in the 70 years. It's not as many as uh, Smith or Ithaca, but it's nothing to sneeze at. Right. So, you know, yeah. it just, it's just, just a lot of fun, very interesting. And I'm I'm glad I fell into this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I think a lot, there's going to be a good showing at the Vintage Gunners Cup of the Parker members. And what will you have on your table at the, at the cup? I'm not exactly sure what Randy Roberts has planned yet. Uh, there's, I think it's going to be a little bit of everything. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's big bore guns where it's nothing but eights and tens and other times, it's you know four tens and twenty eights, so I think there's going to be a little smattering of a little bit of everything involved there. It all, all depends what the membership brings. Yeah. So, it, well, that's wonderful. And and anybody who has a Parker that hasn't uh, kind of connected with the, the the members or the club, they can definitely stop by and speak to you guys. And and I'm sure everybody here will welcome in anybody that like to purchase one or has one and would like to talk about it. Absolutely. And since all four associations are pretty close together in the tent, yes, they can stop at all of them and just, just get the best of the best of everything. Right. And you guys are all friends, even though you guys compete against each other. I see at various shoots. Um, there's no, uh, there's no animosity between all of you. So uh, that myth is, we'll debunk that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Mike, thank you. I know you have to run. Um, stick around as long as you can. But I know that uh, with uh, with people coming in to shoot at your uh, Sporting Clays course, I know you might have to go. So thank you for joining us. You're welcome, Liz. And thanks for having me. Sure, sure. All right. So let's go to Frank with Elsie Smith. So how you doing, Frank? I am doing well, Liz. Thank you for asking. I'll just make one comment on Mike before he leaves. Uh, way back about 20 some years ago, I guess, uh, between Parker and L.C. Smith, we came up with the Parker L.C. Smith Challenge Cup. And it's a, a, it's a challenge cup that's held each year in April with the proceeds from the sign up going to youth shooting, usually, usually the NRA. But the point that I wanted to make is, is that when we first started it, a couple of people on our in our group said this was going to be a grudge match against Parker. <laughs> and I did not know Art Wheaton at the time, but he came to me at one of our displays and he says, Frank, you know, he said, that's really not a good title for this. And he says, we're all in this together. We all we all support early American side by sides. It's all the same, whether it's a Smith, a Parker, whether it's a Lefevre, whether it's a Fox. And he was absolutely right. And I shut that person down that was saying the, the, uh, the, the grudge match. We changed it to the Challenge Cup. It's a friendly competition. We all want to win, of course, as you said at the beginning. But it's, it's a fun event each year. But anyway, I just wanted to comment on, on, on your thing about we're all friends. We are all friends. I'm Frank Finch. I'm the executive director for L.C. Smith. 
I've been executive director for practically the existence of our club, which has been 20 years. I think the first couple of months, we had another executive director who perhaps could have done more work than he did do. So the board elected me and I've been uh, the executive director ever since. We started with, um, with 16 charter members. We have around 950 members. Uh, we do 14, 15 events a year. We have a website, we have a, a forum, we have a journal, a quarterly journal. We do research letters. Elsie uh, Smith, began making shotguns. L.C. Smith and Baker were making shotguns in like 1877. And they made double barrels and they made drillings. And uh, in 1890, uh, L.C. Smith sold the company to the Hunter Brothers. And uh, guns were made by the Hunter Brothers and then by Marlin. But in any event, between 1877 and, and 1950, Hunter Arms, L.C. Smith made 529,000 guns. Of those guns, about 50% or about 250,000 are low, uh, low cost guns, if you will. And, but solid guns, they're, they're O grades, field grades, the same mechanics in a field grade gun that you get in a top grade gun, an, L, an A3, for example, or a deluxe, it's the same gun. It's just the, the matter of the finishing, the tooling, the engraving, the selection of the wood, perhaps the metal, the barrels, but basically it's the same functional gun. Um, in any event, why do I like L.C. Smith? It's the gun that speaks for itself. Uh, the gun is the only, uh, I, I keep saying this to people, it's the only early American true side lock gun. All the parts, the mechanical parts, the hammer, the sears, the, the hammer springs, the firing pins are all in the lock plates, very similar to a purdy for us who enjoy the European guns as well. So it's, um, uh, it's a very great gun. It's a balanced gun. Uh, it's a great shootable gun. The other feature of an L.C. Smith is there was a design by Brown and it's a tapered breaking lever. Uh, guns prior to that would have a breaking lever, which would be a straight shaft, if you will. The L.C. Smith is tapered. So as the gun is used, it constantly stays tight because with the taper and that breaking lever, the gun never shoots loose. And that was a big uh, selling feature of the gun way back at the very beginning. And it continues throughout the whole manufacturing cycle. Um, L.C. Smith's a great gun. Uh, they're beautiful. They eat fun to shoot, they're well balanced. I mean, they look great with the engraving, the wood selections. Uh, as far as myself being a side-by-side -side person, um, little that I know at the age of five years old, my dad had a, uh, a 410 with Damascus barrels, highly engraved, made a Birmingham gun actually with Damascus barrels. And at the time, and I'm talking when I was five, so you know, I'm a few years old, so we're talking probably 1947, right? In 1947, I carried this gun with me, with my dad in the fields, and this was my shotgun shooting caps in it, those red caps that you have on a roll. I put those under the hammers, and we shot, we had beagles, we shot rabbits, and when the rabbit would come by, I would shoot the rabbit with my cap gun. And it wasn't until I was seven years old that I got my first real gun, which was a Stevens hammer gun, single shot hammer gun. And, and of course I could tell you a quick story in that, that my dad said, put the, the buttstock on your shoulder. And of course, when I aimed with that, the gun was a little too long for me. So I knew better. I put the buttstock under my armpit and fired and the hammer came back and caught me right under my right eye. Another inch higher, I would have been blinded in the right eye. My mother was livid. My father was disgusted with me. You'll never be a hunter. You'll never be a shooter. You'll never make the grade. And, and of course, so I started out, as they say, with a rocky start. I graduated to an Ithaca Model 37 pump gun. Um, uh, I, I, we had friends who, uh, my father's friend hunted pheasants and but it side by side in our farm, probably in the 60s. So a number of years, 20 years later, 
came down the field with side by side that turned out to be an LC Smith, was a high grade Smith, a monogram Smith, had two English setters. I said to my dad, why don't we hunt that way? We have beagles, we have, we have pump guns. Why don't we use side by sides and English setters? Totally different hunting, blah, blah, blah. Well, since I got a few bucks, I got out of school. I, I, I got my, well, I got my second LC Smith because my friend who had this expensive gun, I wanted to have one like his. When he informed me it was 16,000 back in 1950 or 60, you know, I said, well, can you get me a cheap one? And he got me one that was restored. It was reblued. The stock was redone. 250 bucks, 225 bucks. I have that gun today and I used that gun for years and years until I bought my first gun when I got out of school. But I started with LC Smith. Um, I started with the 12 gauge. I wanted to get a 20 gauge. I got Brophy's book and I, I made my goal in life to get one LC Smith in 20 gauge of, one, of, every, of every model that they made. And I thought I had it handled a few years ago. I got my A320 gauge, they made two of those. And I got one of the two, I thought I had it made. And Tom Archer, when he wrote an article for Double Gun Journal informed me that they made one Olympic gauge, one Olympic grade 20 gauge, was sent to Texas. I wish I could get my hands on it. It's like, you know, it's the only one that I don't have to have one of every, every grade that they made. But I have all the others and I have, you know, and I love them. They're great guns. They're great to shoot. And I enjoy going in the fall when the air is crisp. I take my English setter Chloe out to the field at the farm. I take my good old L.C. Smith with me and I go searching out for those pheasants that are out there. And it's a great way. I, I not only pheasant hunt with my L.C. Smith, I have a wildfowler used for turkey hunting. Uh, I have several guns I use for sporting clay, several guns for trap shooting, uh, a different gun for skeet shooting. But I love shooting them. I love collecting them. I love hunting with them. And they're super guns. I would recommend them to anyone. I did. I was going to ask you, did you ever get that English setter? So yes, you did, I guess. Oh, yeah. I, I am on English setter number 11. Oh, wow. All right. Well, it, it's, when I got my first L.C. Smith, I got my first English setter puppy, Percival of Somerset. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, that... You know, when I first got into this gun industry, I thought, why would anybody want to have more than just one gun? Well, now that I've been um, around <laughs> people that uh, shoot guns a lot, I have now, oh boy, more than my husband. I have a 410, a 28, a, a handful of 20s. So, and then I have my quail gun and then I have my sporting clays gun. So now I completely understand. So when you say that, how many LC Smiths do you have? I, I'm not a collector, but I know you, you kind of need more than just one gun. <laughs> Absolutely. And you were asking a question before, and I don't know if you wanted to ask of me of what the displays, LC Smith display yes. is going to be. Yes. And it's going to be a Royal flush. And by that, I mean in 20 gauge, I am going to display the top five grade guns that, they, that they've made in 20 gauge. It's gonna be a deluxe 20 gauge. It's gonna be a premier 20 gauge. It's gonna be a monogram 20 gauge, a crown 20 gauge, and an eagle 20 gauge. Okay, wow. And I'm keeping them, and I should, I should point out in that these are all post uh, 1912, 1913 guns, because there are other great guns like an A2, for example, but that's a pre-1913 gun. So I, I, I'm not breaking up the suit. I'm, I'm, yeah. It's a Royal Flush in the same suit in the same in the same gauge of, of, uh, of gun. True, true vintage. Yes. True vintage. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. All right, so let's go to Bob with Lefevre. Hi, Bob, how are you? Oh, thanks for having us, Liz. Sure, sure. Tell us more about Lefevre. And I think you're gonna say that you have a quite a connection with them, right? Yeah. Basically, I was born into it. Uh, uh, Dan Lefevre was my great-great-grandfather. 
Uh, when I was growing up, my mother was the bookkeeper for the Frank Lefevre and Sons uh, Gun Shop, which was founded by uh, Dan Lefevre's son, Frank, and carried on uh, by his son, Art, and his son, Bob, so all the generations. And during that time, there wasn't anything like daycare, so that when I wasn't in school, I was with my mother in the gun shop. Well, and my grandfather, uh, Art Lefevre, uh, taught me how to shoot using a Model 25 uh, Daisy BB gun. He never once told me it was invented by his uncle. <laughs> but uh, there were some family difficulties where um, one of Dan Lefebvre's sons, uh, Fred, uh, and went off and invented the uh, BB, Daisy BB gun uh, and left the family and they um, held a grudge ever since. <laughs> which is kind of amazing. But in any case, uh, growing up there, I uh, developed an appreciation for uh, the Lefebvre uh, shotguns. Plus, uh, they were doing repairs on, on all, of the, all the classic shotguns. They were probably one of the pre premier um, restoration and repair uh, facilities in the country during the 50s and 60s when I was growing up. Um, after I got out of uh, college, I just uh, shot kind of recreationally once a week. Uh, um, and later on, um, I started uh, buying uh, Lefebvre shotguns and gaining more and more um, interest in that. I uh, took over the Lefebvre uh, Collectors Association in 2009 as the executive director and pretty much have been functioning in that uh, capacity. Uh, publishing the newsletter um, ever since. Now, when we get down to the uh, Lefevre guns, um, Lefevre, uh, of course, is credited as being the uh, inventor of the American hammerless uh, shotgun. He came out with the first uh, commercially successful uh, hammerless in, in America um, and went on um, to form a company uh, that lasted until uh, 1916, making uh, double barrel shotguns, some uh, double rifles, uh, some single guns, but primarily uh, double barrel shotguns. They made a total of about 60,000 guns. So compared to, um, you know, uh, Parker and Elsie Smith, they were talking about the hundreds of thousands of guns. The few was a much smaller um, firm and concentrated more on uh, high grade guns or tried to. Unfortunately, this is not the best economic model and uh, Lefebvre went through several business partners fighting that he wanted to compete against the high grade uh, European guns and forego selling the field grade guns that actually created the base profit for uh, the companies like L.C. Smith and, uh, and Parker. Um, I think, in, in my opinion, um, the Lefevers are um, the best uh, uh, designed gun in that they are uh, adjustable. Every, every part of the Lefevre is adjustable. You can um, tighten a screw, tighten uh, the uh, locking bolt, uh, whatever, and never never really, never being able to shoot it loose. And I think they're very well uh, balanced. They look a bit like uh, Frank's uh, L.C. Smith, and but like a side plate, but they are not. Um, the side plate is false. Uh, the side plate is nothing but a, a plate. The uh, mechanism is all built into the frame. So it's kind of like, we call them side plate guns rather than side lock guns. Uh, but it gives the same um, area for engraving uh, that the um, the uh, Smiths have, which I think um, is just a nice nice feature. Uh, so and, is it a box uh, lock, Bob? Is it a box lock then? It's, it, yeah, it, well, the design is actually a box. If that's what you want to consider it, box lock meaning that all of the uh, lock mechanisms, the sears, the hammers, the firing pins are all mounted within the frame, within the within the box, not on the not on the plates. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And uh, what do you plan on bringing to the vintage? We, this time we have a um, display that is uh, uh, called uh, Dan Lefebvre from the beginning. We are taking his very first guns that he started back in, uh, eight, in the 1850s. Um, he started out with muzzle loaders. Uh, he built some sharpshooter rifles that were used in the uh, Civil War. We have one of those. Uh, and then he uh, went on to uh, start uh, making breech-loading guns, and his main business was converting muzzle loaders into um, in, 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 into breech-loading uh, guns. So we have several different uh, models of, of those. Um, so we pretty much are covering uh, for this display the pre-hammerless uh, era of Lefebvre. Oh, nice. But we'll also have a couple of nice shooters there to, to, to see as well. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, thanks, Bob. Thank you. We can't wait to see everything. Um, all right. Last but not least, we have Craig from Fox. Hey, Craig, how you doing? How are you, Liz? Oh, wonderful. Tell us all about Fox. Okay. Um... The A.H. Fox Company was started in 1906 by a gentleman by the name of Ansley H. Fox. Uh, it's, his tagline was finest gun in the world. These other guys would probably argue with that statement, but uh, all of his advertising. Uh, oh, there's my dog. Um, that's okay. You know, Sean, that's pre my husband has the A.H. Fox um book in his collection yeah. of, of gun books so yes i've seen that i've seen uh the book before yeah so uh ansley wasn't shy about uh promoting he was a promoter uh he was in a number of different businesses he actually got into the gun business and i think 1904 or 1905 he was associated with philadelphia arms company another small producer of side-by-side -side shotguns that didn't last very long. They went out of business in about 1905. And somehow he convinced investors in Philadelphia that uh, he had come up with a very simple design, uh, many, many fewer uh, moving parts than uh, the existing guns from L.C. Smith and Parker, and that he could produce these guns um, high quality but low cost because of the simplicity of the mecha mechanism uh, and they basically bought the uh, assets of philadelphia arms out of bankruptcy um, moved into a, uh, the first factory in philadelphia and started producing uh, ah fox shotguns initially there were a limited number of grades, and Ansley was kind of like Dan Fever. He didn't want to make cheap field guns. He wanted to make higher grade um, shotguns for the American market. So uh, that lasted for a while, but the realities of the market started to catch up with Fox, and they must have been losing money. But anyhow, uh, a, a wealthy business family kind of rescued Ansley, bought the company uh, from him uh, in about 1912, I believe it was, and kind of reconfigured the whole company, came out with uh, more grades, but most importantly, they came out with a Sterling Worth, which is the field grade H. Fox gun. That during at the day sold for twenty five dollars, so it was uh, uh, a good gun that was inexpensive, uh, well known for its quality. You know, the same internals is the more expensive uh, graded guns, and they went on to make uh, about one hundred and seventy thousand guns in total. In at the beginning of the Depression, 1929, the Fox Gun Company was bought by Savage and moved to Ithaca, and they continued kind of in a minor way to 
the late 30s uh, and World War II and our exit from World War II basically put a lot of the American makers out of business, Fox included. Savage came up with a gun called the Fox Model B, which is a completely different design, but it confuses people today about you know, what's a real Fox shotgun? An AH Fox made in Philadelphia, Utica is a real Fox shotgun. As far as the uh, AH Fox Collectors Association, we started in uh, 2006. Uh, I was one of the founders along with uh, four other gentlemen. And uh, we have 450 members, paying members. We have a forum, we have a quarterly newsletter. Uh, we participate in all the events like the Vintage Cup, uh, Houseman's, uh, uh, Mike Shoot at Rock Mountain. We have a display table. Um, it's a active group, but obviously we're a little bit smaller than uh, the Parker and L.C. Smith group. But we have fun competing with these guys. We love them. Uh, and like the uh, other gentlemen, I have Parkers. I have L.C. Smiths. I have Lefevers. Uh, we most of us have got them. Got them all. The L.C. Smith, like uh, just to go back a little bit, was a very robust, simple design. That's what I love about it. Um, it it it. It's very interesting because uh, like a lot of the American guns, the engraving and style of engraving kind of follows the fashion of the day during the period when they were made. Uh, some of the examples have very flowery uh, engraving um, and it, it's just, uh, you know, part of that same, same period. Um, I got into shooting as a young man, like the rest of these guys. My dad introduced me to shotguns and 22 rifles uh, when we lived in uh, Massachusetts. I shot at a, in a sand pit across the street from our house, and uh, I was hooked immediately. I was just taken up by the whole thing. Uh, our family moved back to Rochester. I had an uncle by the name of Bill Towner who owned a gun store and uh, uh, boat, boat business. He was a gr uh, big duck hunter, big fisherman. Uh, he introduced me to duck hunting and that really got the hook in. I, uh, I just absolutely love the sport. Uh, how I, discovered foxes is my uncle bill had a fox ce and when i was a young man he'd take it out and shoot it this in the days before non-toxic uh, uh, shells were required and i thought about the gun i didn't think much about it i was you know still in high school college then i got married had a job you know family career the whole bit and then Mike McIntosh's book came out and I picked it up and I read it and it just relit the flame. And I said, man, I got to have a few of these. I remember Uncle Bill shooting his Fox CE. Initially, it was really, really hard to collect American guns before the Internet. And uh, there were a few weekly newspapers that came out, shotgun news and whatever. but you know, no pictures, crummy discussion, uh, de descriptions. So uh, as I got more and more into collecting and looking for guns, um, the internet came along, started our first forum probably in not, not, uh, 2005 or 2006. And that's what eventually morphed into the H. Fox Collectors Association. And like Mike said, it's a place for people that are interested in foxes to go, to gain information, to ask questions about what shells should I use, and uh, so on and so forth. 
new collectors come to the site and immediately make friends with like-minded people. Um, it's It's been a great ride and uh, like the other associations, it's really been great for the, the hobby and the, and the sport. Yeah. That's my story. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. Thanks, Craig. You know, um, just the shooting in general is a community, the the sportsmen and then and women. And then you guys are almost the club within the club, which I think is great. And if anybody out there um, wants to purchase some American classic guns, they can come to the Vintage Gunners Cup if you already have one. I'm going to ask you all to share with me the forums and, of course, the websites, and I'll put those all in uh, kind of the notes here on this video so people can connect with you. And um, I, know, I know people who just want to be part of the club, so they go and they get like a Parker, and they uh, just are so excited to be part of the community. And, um, well, and that brings me to... Um, talking about the, we're going to call it the Fox International Challenge, because uh, Daryl Corona is going to head up uh, this challenge, and um, it's going to be held at the five stand, and it's going to be, now you guys all come together, um, it's going to be American versus European, so you can uh, partake in this event um, by shooting at the five stand, 25 uh, rounds, 25 plays, and um, you can actually shoot the whole time, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I think up until noon on Saturday, but by then you have to hand in, and pretty much you should hand in every evening, um, your card. So you'll have a card that says the International Challenge, and you'll have to fill that out and then uh, hand that in. And then they're going to take, Daryl's going to take uh, 10 from the American classic guns and then those shooters and then 10 from the European and um and how he does that you know you know I think he's gonna figure that out I think he's gonna take eight of the top scores and then two uh, any score you know randomly picked so um and then he's gonna have semifinals and then at the you know that will determine the five American classic guns go against the five international guns. So we will also have in the notes here uh, below the, you know, the guidelines for that. So if you are a competitive shooter uh, and you have an, an American classic gun or you have a European gun, uh, certainly maybe some of you have both, you could be in uh, in either, either camp. So, um, so yeah, I'm I'm really excited that's going to happen. I'm not sure. Have you, um, have you seen this before? Have you ever been to a shoot where they have the American guns versus the European guns before, guys? Maybe uh, a long time ago. They, 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 I, I had one experience going out to California where it was similar, and I'm not sure it was shot on a five stand. I really don't remember. It's been a long time ago. But it was really the European gunners against, it was like the colonials against the Tories or something. But it was basically the same thing. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And it was the high, you know, the high score sh shooters from each of the, the two squads, if you will, sh competing against each other. But it was really great fun. It really was. I think it's going to bring out some spectators too. So um, I think we're going to try to find a, uh, a British and a maybe a Spanish flag and then we'll of course have our American flag and um, yeah well and I don't think uniforms this year but maybe gray and red next year we'll see <laughs> we'll see Mike did you have a question Michael yeah. wears Hawaiian shirt shirt <laughs> <laughs> I have information for you on what Randy's planning for the Parker booth and display okay okay the theme for the display this year is going to be long barreled Parkers. So four tens are going to be 28 inches and over 20 gauge is going to be 38 inches and over and all the other gauges 32 inches and over. So they're all going to be long legged. All right. Nice. Well, thank you guys so much. This is, I can't wait to, um, 
to see you guys in person in a couple weeks. And this has been a lot of fun. And I, you know, I've learned a lot and I hope some other people did too. Thank you for having us. And it was enjoyable to, uh, to meet with you again and, and with my friends from our fellow early American side-by-side -side community. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to sign off and we will see you guys in a couple weeks. Thank All right. you. All right. Bye. Bye. Be well, guys. Goodbye.